Yes, make sure you yep. are green. There we go. I'm green. Yes, good. Thank you very much for coming. Cool. Wow, this is this is an awesome audience. So, um, yeah, I'm Richard. I'm the chairman of the OpenSUSE project. Um, so I've been actually contributing to OpenSUSE for about well. 12 years, as long as the project's been around, and some genius thought I should be in charge. Um, and actually, I'm going to talk about how distribution projects specifically, but I think most open source projects out there seem to have forgotten why we have governance, why we have a project in the first place, and, and talk a little bit about some of the consequences that we're actually facing in the real world with our projects. And yeah how we might want to change and rethink actually what we're doing when it comes to keeping, yeah, keeping our projects running, how we're governing them. So, you know, ultimately answering the question, does governance matter? Um, and when talking about governance, it's, it's, it's quite easy to talk about, you know, the leadership, the guy in charge, the guy at the top, you know, and, and obviously, you know, a certain person at the, at the top of any food chain can have a, a significant influence or oh, maybe not such an influence, but um, <laughs> but but yeah, you know, does does have an impact on on how the organisation below works, thinks about things, talks about things, and and also talking with other people and other organisations. But really, at the heart of it, it shouldn't be about the person at the top. The question of of, of, of projects governance and organisation and, and how it actually works should all be about the influence that any one individual can have. Any new person joining the project, any one person in there, can they, you know, be be this sort of you know, pebble dis disturbing the entire ocean of a whole distribution or the entire open source ecosystem at large? And this this kind of thought of of you know, can is there the power of one in open SUSE is what really got me thinking on this topic of of do we meet that test that any person can can join and and really influence where the project is going? And of course, when I was thinking of that, I was looking at all these other projects and, and got me thinking of you know just how does everybody else do it? And I kind of realised that the situation's way way messier and way nastier than I was expecting, um, and and not nearly as, as, as free as, as, and open as I was hoping it to be in you know, an open source ecosystem. Um, and, and so sort of when, when thinking about this, I, I realized I, I wanted to sort of talk about which, yeah, who does the project serve really? What is the point of an open source project? What is the point of an open of a distribution project? You know, why does what, who does the project itself serve? Who does it? Who is it meant to benefit? And the first time I ask this to, to most people, they answer, you know, we're here for the users. You know, it's here. You know, we're doing something to give software to the users. And the more I thought about it, the more I agreed. I thought that's totally effing wrong. <laughs> it is. Our projects do not exist to benefit the users, and in fact, uh, well, me. You know, I say we. Sh I say, they d and if you disagree with me, I'd say then we. They should not benefit the users. The project should exist to benefit the people working in the project. The software that we produce. Yes, that's in totally for the users, but that's the product, that's the, the end result. The governance, the structure, the methods, the policies, the processes, every decision we make as a project about how we're going to organize ourselves as a project should be orientated to serve the needs of the people in that project. As soon as you forget that and start focusing on the end users and start feeding that into the, the sort of organization of the project, Projects time and time again lose their way, they lose focus, they lose their, they lose their purpose. And you end up with yeah, yeah, distributions that try and solve everything for everybody and then no one uses it because it doesn't do the thing they wanted to have done. Um, so it, it, really, yeah, it really has to exist to provide yeah, a collective benefit to your maintainers, to your contributors, to your volunteers. Because if it doesn't provide a collective benefit, you're not going to have any maintainers. You're not going to have any contributors. No one's going to bother joining your project. And uh, yeah, it, I, this does require a bit of a mindset change for some projects. Some people do, you know, really stick to this mentality of, of sort of users first. But the project has to be there for its contributors. And I'm now going to stop using the word contributors. Um, 
Because language matters, and this, this framing matters. You know, when, when you talk about contributors, there's this kind of tendency to, especially as a leader of a distribution project, you know, it, it kind of comes with an implication of it's my project and you're just contributing to it. You know, I don't like that kind of hidden meaning behind, it often gets kind of labelled with the thing of a contributor. You know, the, the, there's you know, the sort of suggestion of, of a contributor doesn't really have ownership of the end result, they're just contributing to that end result. And, and on, the, on the other opposite side, you know, with, with language, you know, maintainers quite often comes with, uh, you know, an opposite connotation. It's, we're just maintaining it, we're just keeping it where it is, or, you know, it's ours, it's mine. Ultimately, no matter what anybody in your project is doing, doesn't matter if they're, you know, helping with the artwork or helping with ideas or dealing with, you know, support forums or whatever, they're all volunteers. I would contest every single person in an open source project is a volunteer. Either literally they're doing it in their spare time and totally voluntarily, but even when dealing with uh, open source projects where corporations are involved, ultimately the corporation is there voluntarily, they can always go elsewhere, and the people working in those corporations are there voluntarily, unless you can give me an example of an open source company that has slave labor, but there shouldn't be, um, and I really hope there isn't. Um, so, as soon as you start realizing that and thinking in those terms and realizing every single person in your project is a volunteer, a lot of these weird questions about how should we, yeah, how should we deal with this direction? How should we deal with this idea? You know, how should we organize our, yeah, you know, our leadership committees and technical groups and, and that kind of thing suddenly becomes a lot easier to actually answer and totally changes the context in, in how you approach these problems. Because ultimately, you, the, the, the kind of underlying bit of this, they're, they're volunteers. If you're not, again, not dealing with the needs of your volunteers, they can walk away. And when they do walk away, your project suffers for it. And I just pressed the wrong button. There we go. And, and this kind of, yeah, sums up with this quote too, you know, we're, we're here doing Linux, doing distributions, you know, it's free, but the project, you know, the work you are doing for the project isn't free, it's valuable, it's beneficial. And so, it, you know, we have to have the project structured in a way that it somewhat is its own reward, and it caters there so that that project is providing a value add to that contributor, to that volunteer. And yet, if you look at so many of our projects, what's the first thing we do when it comes to structuring them and organizing them and having some kind of governance? We have a committee. Um, and starting without the distribution, but just Apache, and this is Apache HTTPD, but this is actually true to sort of every single Apache project. You know, in this, you know, every Apache project has their, their working group in, in the, the top, which you know, all major changes must be voted on. Any Apache developer can vote on, on any Apache working group's uh, changes, which is nice. However, only the active maintainers for that active working group are the ones that their vote is actually binding. So, you know, basically, if you want to get any change into Apache HTTPD, you have to be friends with, you know, at least three of the, the maintainers there. But on the flip side, because, you know, they're trying to be very equal opportunities and they're open there, anybody can veto anything. So... Basically, if you're a new guy trying to contribute to Apache, you, it, you really are going to have a hard time, you know, unless you're surprisingly lucky. And th this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It works very well for them. I think I would actually say it works very well for the majority of Apache's projects, um, because most of Apache's projects are somewhat narrow in focus and narrow in scope, and therefore, you know, having a, a narrow decision-making model has certain benefits. You can, you know, theoretically get changes through rather, rather quickly. But then, having a look at the broader ecosystem, how many different web servers do we now have in, you know, in the Linux ecosystem, you know, Nginx and, and, and the like, all competing with Apache because Apache doesn't do it the way they think should be done? Well, why couldn't Nginx get their lightweightness into the Apache HTTP project? Well, because this decision-making model Will ne it will never get past this kind of committee process. You know, they're thinking in their way, doing things their way, and they've structured their entire decision-making and acceptance model 
in a way that reinforces the status quo. You know, Debian does this kind of a lot as well, but you know, and lots of other projects do. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but, pe but when we're deciding our governance models for our projects, we really should be thinking about the impact that has on where can this project go you know, long term? How can it change? How can it be sustainable? How revolutionary can it be? You know, with this model, uh, there isn't going to be some massive, fundamental, world-changing rewrite of Apache unless you know, they're really, those guys over there are really smoking something nice. Um, and that might be a good thing, but it does mean that over time things are likely to stagnate, things are likely to slow down, things are likely to get harder, and then that's how projects decline, that's how projects go away, and then we need new projects to come up and stand up there. But does it have to be that way? Could we, you know, to do a have a sustainable project, shouldn't the model potentially be one where the project itself is more open to challenge within itself, therefore, you know, accepting changes more broadly, not voting against, you know, not having easy vetoing and not having very select approvals. And when dealing with larger projects like distributions, that model has massive scalability problems. You, know, you can't deal with that many incoming requests. You know, the, your poor core maintainers have to approve every single thing and you have to have at least three of them, so that thing all backs up there. You can't just add more people to the committee. That's what some projects try with, with this kind of approach, but that just ends up with more people in the committee arguing with each other. Um, so it doesn't really solve the problem at all. Um, in fact, it quite often makes it worse. And, and like we've been talking about for the last few minutes, really, it, it provides a barrier of entry to the project. A new contributor is going to feel that it's, that it's harder to get in there. In some cases, some of these projects, some of these committees that follow this model, you know, the people involved are really nice, friendly, opening people, which somewhat mitigates the reality of that. You know, if, if, if you've got the right people in that place, they, you know, a lot, you know, they'll accept crazy changes, they'll accept that challenge. So the model doesn't necessarily always mean that barrier of entry is real, but it's perceived. You know, as a new person, you're not going to know who that, that nice guy is. So are you going to send that crazy change that you have, that you've baked in, in, a, in a dark corner somewhere, or are you just going to declare a new project on GitHub and do it in there? And you know, Is this why we end up with so many forks of so many projects all over the place? Because they never realized they could actually contribute to the upstream because the upstream was structured in the wrong way in the first place. And this is why I talk more about Debian. Because Debian has their technical committee, you know, which is there to decide any matter of technical policy, um, especially where you've got situations where developers uh, uh, have overlapping jurisdictions. Um, they can also just make a decision because someone asked for a decision, and they have the right to overrule a developer, um, which I find really weird because it's like we're all volunteers and, and we're all doing, especially in Debian, you know, there's, there's no company behind it. It's like, what do they expect if they ever overrule a developer? Like, this guy's doing it this way. This committee says he's doing it wrong. It's like, is a volunteer really going to change what he's doing? No, that's how you lose a contributor or you, you know, at least don't get that person's contribution on that topic. And the system D, uh, you know, Debian and system D, you know, is kind of a perfect case study on, on how the Debian model can be followed perfectly. Every part of, of every person involved in the decisions with system D did their job in Debian perfectly. The technical committee, I do not fault for their decisions at all. I think they were perfectly right and valid. I also think the Debian community who objected to everything going on with system D were doing their part perfectly right and valid. But, um, and yeah, more about that in a minute. But yeah, the technical committee decided in Debian decided that system D would be in Debian as a default. But they purposefully, and I think quite smartly, decided that they wouldn't decide on whether packages could depend on a specific init system. But, you know, some people don't like system D. So there was a flame war that lasted nine months. Um, and that, that discussion pissed off a lot of people. That discussion had a lot of upset people on both sides. It led to the fork of, of Devyun. And ultimately, they decided, let's have a democratic vote on this and decide, you know, what is our way forward? And after nine months, collectively, the Debian project decided that they didn't need to make a decision. Which is ultimately the right decision. It's the one the technical committee made in the first place. There's nothing wrong with that. But how much pain and upset did their process and their structure cause? 
it's not, you know, no one's at fault, but the entire project organization created this problem, not system D, but the model they decided to follow. And therefore, what benefit did that model really bring Debian? It didn't make a quicker decision, didn't get more people involved, it led people away. How did that work? And in fact, the te technical committees generally, how often does a technical committee bring nothing to a project but an opportunity for someone to say no to a developer? Because a developer doesn't need someone to say yes, they're going to do it anyway. And on this topic, I went off about corporate overlords, companies, you know, working in, working in this space, because, you know, they do too. So, um, yeah, obviously, I work for SUSE, so I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm going to start with our friends at Red Hat. No. Uh, actually, no. I'll, get you, I'll, get, I'll get back with that later. <laughs> Fedora have their Fedora Council, um, which, um, spe speaking as chairman of the OpenSUSE board, I can shamelessly admit, when we started the OpenSUSE project, we basically copy and pasted our structure from their structure. But things have changed over the last 12 years. So the Fedora Council, as it stands today, has a very similar role to my purpose in the OpenSUSE project. Um, but Oh no, sorry, it doesn't anymore, it used to. Now it has this role of identifying, organizing, and enabling the project's goals. It's currently 10 people. Eight of them are employed by Red Hat. Two of them are elected by the community. So three of them are directly appointed by Red Hat. The remaining five are appointed by the board. So, you know, it's a nice internal loop. Um, and even uh, one of those two elected by the community is employed by Red Hat. <laughs> how much, yeah, much non-Red Hat community influence can possibly be in that board, you know. <laughs> do you think Fedora's goals might ever be challenged to do anything other than what Red Hat are deciding they want to do? You know. so it depends how much Red Hat is pushing those people to do the Red Hat thing in Fedora. Uh, yes, that, and there is... There is and the, how many of them are just employed by Red Hat to keep them at Fedora and not going somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Possibly. That, that may, yeah, but ultimately, I, I mean, when speaking as somebody who works in an organization very similar to Red Hat, you know, organizational bias really is a thing. Inside SUSE, we have lots of well-meaning people who have their own ideas and thinking their own thing, but when you're surrounded with a whole bunch of people doing something, you know, for your corporate overlords, you're going to end up thinking along the same lines even by accident. So you, you can't have... If you're trying to do a general, let's say, for example, it's like Fedora and OpenSUSE, you know, pretty much a general purpose distribution in the open source space, if you go this model, you're not going to have anything challenging your kind of perceived organizational bias. You know, you're going to go in that direction which, you know, your corporate management or whatever mm -hmm. decide, either fully wholeheartedly because, you know, you're forced to do so, but like I said, we don't really have slave labor in the open source world, but even by accident, you're going to be thinking along those terms, focusing on those goals that, you know, corporate Red Hat or corporate SUSE have decided, and you're going to be pushing in that direction, even if it's somewhat unconscious. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's better when dealing with, with, with a mixed sort of corporate and open governance model to have a system that's designed where you know, challenge must be baked in. You know, there must be, and I'll get to that more later because otherwise I won't have anything to talk about later. Um, and yeah, just to really be horrible to Fedora again, but you know, in addition to their leadership board, they also have a technical steering committee, um, which basically doesn't set the long-term goals, but decides on every single blah, every single package that's going into the distribution and what the software should be available to the end user. That is also currently nine people. Uh, that's a copy-paste from the charter for the uh, technical. Software is referred to end user. Uh, that's a copy-paste. But it's, it's what they wrote down. <laughs> okay, so that's what they say they're responsible for. You know, they may not practice it, but whatever. Whatever they're doing, you know, there's nine of them, seven are employed by Red Hat. My, uh, my other point is to so say... These, these are the guys responsible for this to be introduced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ultimately. Um, and, and, yeah, and like we've been talking about, you know, in open source, I, re I do agree with Linus here, you know, I think, you, you know, our contributors should have the right to control their own destiny. Um, if it, it's not real open source if one person can't make a difference in a project. Um, and then, kind of, the worst example of that is somewhat, you know, <laughs> Ubuntu. But I do give credit to Canonical here 
at least they're honest and very, very clear about it. You know, their, their organizational structure is one where basically Mark is in charge and Mark nominates who he wants to have in their community council, which is sort of doing the, the, the conflict resolution and, and community management side of things. And Mark decides who's in the technical board. Um, you know, obviously. So, you know, again, that's a structure where a new individual coming to the project or any individual within the project is going to be somewhat limited in how much they can change you know, in the project as a whole and, and, you know, and how much that can grow and maintain and move faster in the future. Um, and I'm putting myself again there. What about SUSE and OpenSUSE? More about that later. <laughs> because we, like I say, we started, well, go back, we started pretty much copying what Fedora were doing. You know, when Fedora started 12 years ago, we started sort of six months later. Um, and, and, you know, it, the, the goals from SUSE was to kind of bootstrap something on the same lines. But inside SUSE, there's some mentality differences than inside Red Hat. And it's really interesting to me to see the difference now, 12 years later, of just how far those two original starting points have, have diverged. And also how humorously bad some of the experiments were that we tried. Um, and one of those that we tried straight out of the gate, because we thought this was really, really good, was direct democracy. You know, let's have everybody deciding everything about the direction of everything in our distribution. Um, and yeah, Winston's right. It's the worst of everything, yeah, apart from everything else that's been tried. Um, in, in our case, we even, you know, in typical SUSE fashion, made a tool for it. So there's a tool called Open Freight. You can still see it today, sadly, because I haven't quite taken the heart to kill it yet. But it started as an, an open SUSE equivalent of SUSE's initial internal feature tracking tool. So the tool that they use still today for deciding what features go into their enterprise products. You know, fate, you know, decide, deciding the fate of the world. Um, as, well, feature, uh, or, I can't remember, what they, it's a pretty abbreviation for something as well, like feature and tracking enhancements or something. Um, uh, yeah, but op an open fate was de decided to be yeah, totally and utterly open, where Anybody can suggest any feature they want, and the community can vote on any feature that they want. Um, in fact, yeah, and, and there are hundreds of feature requests, thousands of votes, and I can honestly say, as the guy who quite often goes through this trying to see how we're doing with that kind of thing, the impact on the project's priorities are negligible. <laughs> Every time I close a feature as done on there, we fixed it by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Never because it uh, yeah, I, I am yet to find a developer who's actually looked at Open Fate and done anything because it was in Open Fate. Um, you know, there's been a few times at SUSE where we've like copy pasted it and put it in as a feature for sleeve, but that's you know just <laughs> it was convenient. Um, but it, it does not work. Um, I, but this quote about democracy got me thinking because in fact when we <laughs> When we think about open source projects, especially when we think about how did it all begin, where did we all start, how does Linux work? You know, it, it is, it, you know, it, the inmates should be running the asylum. Why, why not? That's where we started. In fact, you know, looking way back to the beginning, you know, the first rule of the cathedral and the bazaar. Every good software starts by developers scratching their own itch. So why have we forgotten that? You know, you don't need to tell your volunteers what to do. They know what needs to be done. They're working on the code base. They're using it themselves. They need to have the tools and the environment to do that. So that is something that a project really should be thinking about to bring as a value add to its contributors. That's, what they, that's, what, that's one place they should definitely be starting. And your volunteers should be feeling empowered that they can do whatever they want to be doing with that software, for that, for that project as a whole. And it doesn't matter if you had someone telling them what to do anyway, because they're not going to listen to you. That's what we learned from Open Freight. So, as sort of core principles that I really think that more projects need to remember they should have at their heart, whatever they're doing, distributions or otherwise. 
respect your volunteers. They do not need to work for you. They can move elsewhere. Um, even if you're paying them, they can move elsewhere. Um, you should be focusing on enabling them, making sure they have the tools and the processes to do their work. And you should be trusting them. You know, you, they don't need to have management or project managers or, or you know, technical committees deciding on what needs to be done. The best person to decide is the volunteer doing that work. But anarchies are crazy. So, and anarchies don't sustain either. They have a habit of exploding. So, respecting your maintainers is great, but don't give them too much respect. Now, another example from Debian is the Debian maintainership model. You know, a Debian maintainer is pretty much God for his package, which is that's which is nice to hear, because the the model of of sort of you know a single overlord of a package will not last in the long term. Um, so. Structure your project in a way where any person in a position of influence can be challenged. New volunteers should be able to come off the street, start working with the existing volunteers, you know, or ultimately replace them, um, which can be a daunting concept in some example, uh, in some projects, in some structures. But you know, if you if you can't pass that test, I think you're doing something wrong. Enable them, but you know. Too much freedom can be a bad thing, you know, everything going off spinning in different directions. So if you look at what, for example, we do with OpenSUSE in our tools and, and things like OBS and OpenQA, all of the tools and processes are designed in a way that they're there to not just let the developer do what they want to do, but encourage and guide it towards good practice, good guidelines, and ultimately long-term sustainable maintainership. Because you have that first concept where you want to have the capability of any developer possibly disappearing and being replaced by another, you've got to have a little bit of sort of common standards and common structures so you know you guy off the street can understand what the hell the last guy did. Um, but doing that in, t in as part of a structured sort of tooling or processes generally works a hell of a lot better than relying it to being people in technical committees and decision making groups. Because ultimately, as <laughs> it's kind of fun to admit with developers. We argue with people all the time. If you do it in a tool, we're really unlikely to argue with a bot. Um, so, you know, having that there um, is, is a, a very clean way of making sure that you can la you know, last with this model in the long term. And you do want to trust your, uh, you know, your developers and your, your volunteers, but conflicts of opinion will arise and you need to have a tie-breaking solution. In OpenSUSE, we basically sum this entire philosophy up in what phrase? Those that do decide, um, which I say way too often, um, and yeah, citation needed. It, I, I can't find an excuse besides where we use it, so OpenSUSE. So we're, we're living this philosophy. You know, we're, we're, we're focusing on making sure our volunteers are the ones deciding where OpenSUSE is going down. Obviously, we're not expecting everybody to do everything on their own. Um, so we encourage to have self-organized teams. Um, uh, we just had that last talk, uh, sorry, talk before last, um, where uh, collaborators were talking about their, uh, how they were using OBS and that whole kind of model of, of multiple OBS projects layering over each other. That feature in OBS is born from this concept of self-organized teams because we needed to have this model where anybody can go to our building service, anybody can start working on it, and we kind of gr start grouping people together based on common packages that they're working on, but they do that in a separate project, so they can have their own rules, they can have their own structure, they can do all things their own way, um, so it's devolved but not an an anarchic. And again, in those tools, in those structures, we define that by consensus generally, you know, our mailing lists are where that, the general concepts are defined and agreed, and then they're implemented generally in tooling, which are then overseen by other volunteers. So they're open source too, so if you want to change the tooling, and you know, all you need to do is a commit request. Um, so that, that's sort of how we keep those general standards, rather than having an overbearing technical committee making decisions in a dark room. Um, it's all done in tooling, in open, in the public, and therefore all changeable at any moment's notice because it's all easily just committable. So in action, you know, this, this sort of democratic approach. Yeah, uh, yeah, I wanted to avoid using that word. Um, anybody can log into the OpenSUSE build service today and, ch and submit any change to any package in the OpenSUSE code base. No permissions required. 
existing volunteers will automatically be notified. OBS will automatically say, hey, this needs a review. Um, and, but they give, they're not, that review isn't a blocking. It's there to give an opportunity. If they don't review it in a timely manner, we're going to assume that new person off the street is probably you know, good enough to at least reach the next stage of the review and move on from that. So you know, they have a chance to start working with the person. They don't have a chance to block everything. And therefore, the contributions do all of the talking. We, we generally, are f when we're dealing with a new contribution in, in the open source code base, our, our first criteria, our first thoughts, are much more about how easy is it for us to carry that change. We generally don't ask, at least on the, the human side of things we're reviewing, does this actually work, or is this the direction we want to go in? Um, because we have those automatic checks in our tooling with OBS and with OpenQA. So the does it work question is a simple case of, is it going to work? You know, we leave we leave that out of the equation entirely, um, and of course that does sometimes mean that some changes take a little bit longer to get in because the person doing the change also has to write the test to get it into the test suite, so they can prove that it works. Um, but it really does mean that those contributions can go in any direction. There's no overarching control. There's no overarching features or functions. So we don't have any steering committees. We don't have any technical boards, benevolent dictators, project managers. We don't even have community managers. I mean, it, it's the whole thing is meant to be self-managing, self-governing, and ultimately self-sustaining. And therefore, System D ends up being another good example. Because we were the first distribution to actually have System D in our code base. It was like July 2010. Like I think the first commits were in like April, and we had a package in our distro in July. Um, because one guy, Kai, I mean, admittedly he was the upstream developer for System D, wanted to put it in the distribution. Um, and it became a default in 2012. The changes were made by the people who wanted to have it in the distribution. And actually one of them sitting there smiling at me. <laughs> um, if people didn't want it, and there was of course some objections on our mailing list and, and some discussion, the answer in this model is simple, fine. We're not forcing this on anybody. There's no overarching decision that we must use system D. If you can do something better, if you can do something else, if you want to still carry sysv in it as well, then do the work. In this case, the current sysv init maintainers weren't really that interested in carrying on doing that. So, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen and we now are only a system D distribution. But there was no conscious decision for that. There was no management decision, there's no management. Um, and ultimately, there was no major strife. You know, there wasn't a huge blow up. We didn't lose contributors. We didn't have a you know horrifically nasty time. We are where we are, and we got there without, yeah, without the the, the strife that other models by accident just cause. Peace. And this model has some really significant benefits. Open SUSE. The more we've embraced this model, the more we've fine-tuned it, the more we realize this is the way we should be doing things, has become more and more agile, where we can now, as a distribution, deal with changes with whatever our upstream projects are doing at a rate of pace that not even Arch Linux can do. You know, we're able to keep up with everybody at every speed um, at full pace without any problem. And we can also deal with all the wonderful eccentricities of all our various upstreams. So, you know, every upstream does something different. They have different release schedules. They have different structures. Because we've got this devolved model where the contributors are deciding how it works and they're, you know, they're working close with their upstreams, they know what crazy stuff they're doing. Um, so they're dealing with that. And there's no kind of overarching policy of, of again, okay, picking on Debian, sorry, but no overarching policy of, like, you know, we cannot change version numbers ever. Um, you know, in our case, even in our stable distribution, even in our enterprise distribution, you know, if an upstream has made some change for some patch that's security critical or otherwise needed for SUSE's enterprise customers, SUSE will look at that and think, okay, we can backport that change, or we can change the version number. And they'll decide there which one makes more sense for that case. Sometimes they'll just backport it, quite often they do. Sometimes you end up with a version bump, even in enterprise distribution. Yeah. And therefore, you know, you end up with a nice, f yeah, free approach of, yeah, if it works and you'll support it, it gets in. It isn't perfect. <laughs> Freedom has its problems. 
Um, one of which being the paradox of choice. You know, if uh, develop, you know, a new person coming into your project has an option to do whatever they want, so they decide to do nothing because they can't decide what they want to do. Um, it, it can be overwhelming, and I don't have a great answer for that. Um, you know, obviously things like, you know, obviously documenting your current pain points, documenting where you know where you ideally might need to have a little bit of help can can help. But then of course you want to avoid crossing that line to telling people what to do. Um, so that yeah, that part does get a little bit tricky. So my current approach to deal with that one is do presentations like this to make help people realize you know this is how we're working, this is how we're thinking, and. Don't panic, just pick what you want to do and go ahead with it. It also has a, a common tendency to have misconceptions. You know, obviously, you know, you're going to have senior developers who've been in your project for a long time. It, it, you know, they might be seen to be, you know, thou that can't be questioned. Um, but in this model, everyone needs to realize that everybody can be questioned. You know, in addition to my work that I do with OpenSUSE, or as the chairman of OpenSUSE, I've currently been working on restructuring how we do all of our BTFS sub-volumes in, in SLEE and OpenSUSE. I spent months on this. It's been like keeping me up at night. Everything is now finally in the distribution. I know tomorrow some other guy can come in and change everything, and I can't stop them. Um, but that's fine. That's how it should be. Because if they think they can do it better than me, isn't that why I was doing it in the open in the first place? You know, so yeah, it just. It, but that mentality needs to be communicated. People need to realise they can challenge everybody in a project. But that challenge sometimes means you've got more than one person wanting to pull in a different direction, and conflicts happen. And you you need to have some solution to resolve deadlock, or avoid deadlock. Or you need to have what I've started calling now organisational checksums. Yeah, because you don't want developers slapping each other. <laughs> Conflicts happen, you know, like I say, volunteers, we're human, mostly. Um, we have different ideas. Those ideas might not be, co you know, compatible with each other. And compromises can be hard to find. But most distributions go and call this a technical problem. You know, they put this, this conflict resolution under their role of their technical committee. And, you know, and how many mailing list threads do we have in, in all our projects? All arguing about the technical benefit of this over that and whatever. Bullshit. It's not a technical problem. You have two developers or multiple groups of developers who have an interpersonal issue with each other. And you need to think about these problems in that context. Forget about the technical solution. Because ultimately, even if one of the answers is 100% technically better, it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, the only one that matters is the one that's going to be maintained two years from now or three years from now in the future. So ultimately, the only bit that matters is the one that has the, you know, the motivation behind it, the people who want to make it move. You know, it, the, the, the better solutions don't necessarily win. The motivated ones win. Um, and so when you've got these interpersonal issues, you need to find a way of basically satisfying the motivations of as many of the people involved as you can. It needs to have a human touch. You need to be dealing with the humans and seeing it in human terms. And you need to make sure that all sides of the argument are not just heard, but feel that they have been heard, feel that their concepts have been understood and thought about and dealt with. And that's how you get to these compromises of actually how we end up with everybody moving the whole Linux and distribution ecosystem forward. It's also how you sometimes end up with like five or six different versions of a package in your distribution. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because you can find compromises to the weirdest problems. Uh, another perfect example is in OpenSUSE, the desktop options we have. You know, we have KDE as our kind of default. Uh, GNOME equally fully supported. And lurking away in some dark corner of the Tumbleweed code base, we still have KDE 3. Because we've got maintainers who still today manage to get it in the distribution and make it work. No KDE 4, luckily. But they still have KDE 3. I think they're crazy, but I can't stop them, and that's fine because you know they're able to they're able to keep it working and they're able to work that way, and you know that's fine. And every now and again, the KDE 5 guys and the KDE 3 guys end up doing something stupid, like sharing a library name, and everything goes horribly wrong. Um, but you know, when you get them around the table and talk about that issue there, and deal it on a personal level, 
every time they found a compromise for their problem. We don't have to decide, oh, we're going to drop KDE3 because the library got the same name. So decision making should always be an app in this kind of conflict should be an absolute last resort. You shouldn't be trying to decide this side versus that side or this solution over that solution. You really should be aiming for a compromise. You really need to be aiming for, for really, ultimately, going back to the original concept of enabling your volunteer to do what your volunteer wants to do in the first place. So if you can, find a way for everyone involved to do what they want to do. And if you do make a decision, you've got to realize that the, the thing you're deciding at the end of it the people conflicting and yelling at each other for the last six months on your mailing list still got to be the ones implementing that solution. So, you know, you don't want to be yourself in a situation where you've made some overarching decision and you know, thou developer must go do this. And well, they're not going to do it because they disagree with it. So what's the point of the decision making process? So basically what you need, you know, if you have a problem and no one else can help, you need to have an A-team of sorts. In OpenSUSE, we have that as the OpenSUSE board, which is our evolution of what was once sort of our copy of the Fedora Council. Unlike the Fedora Council, this board has no responsibility whatsoever when it comes to uh, dealing with goals and long-term planning and whatever. I mean, sometimes we do it and give suggestions and sometimes people listen. Um, but the responsibilities are just that that you see on the board there. We're there to resolve conflicts. We're there to be a central point of contact for the project, and we are the absolute decision makers of absolute last resort. Um, and because, of course, we have a corporate sponsor in the case of SUSE, um, we also have the responsibility of keeping touch with SUSE and vice versa, because you know, it's easy for the company if they've got a group of people to immediately talk to and ask questions of and that kind of thing. Internally, uh, we've taken a model um, which yeah, has sort of, yeah, somewhat changed from, uh, uh, from what everyone else is doing, um, apart from GNOME, actually, because this is very similar to the GNOME project model, um, where we have five elected board members, um, elected by our community, uh, which are currently OpenSUSE members, um, which are basically currently established, uh, well, existing established volunteers. Um, the, the selection criteria for OpenSUSE members is actually something that I think we need to fix. Right now in OpenSUSE there is a selection committee or a, a membership committee which decides have you done enough stuff to contribute, which of course goes against everything I've just been talking about for the last half an hour. Um, uh, that is something which, well, hopefully the rest of the community will be able to see the presentation and now understand why I'm about to suggest that we simplify that and make it a case of if you contributed and you want to be a member, then you're a member. You know, it, you know, it isn't going to work any different. It's just going to be a heck of a lot easier to get you know, people involved and integrated into the community. An elected board member has a two-year term. We don't want to keep on replacing the entire board every two years, so... At one year we replace two of them, one, every, yeah, every other year we replace three of them. Um, but we have this really hard rule, um, no more than two board members, so no more than 40%, which is the same as the GNOME Foundation, um, can have the same employer. So if you do the math, you know, best case for SUSE, they can only have two people on the, elected into the board. That's it. Um, therefore, you know, you've got a company that's actually adopted the same mentality here of creating a structure in their own friendly project which they you know which they started and sponsored that is designed to challenge themselves they you know there is no way that, that you know Susie can have overarching control of the board there is a sixth person me um, which is appointed by SUSE. Um, so they guaranteed to have at least one person in there, which for several years in OpenSUSE, I've been the only one. Um, you know, there's, you know, the community elected you know, all non-SUSE employees, and I was there kind of on my own, which is great, yeah. And nothing, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, and I have the additional responsibility of, of, you know, being the one guy who's meant to talk to SUSE all the time. Um, but ultimately, I... I Whereas, oh, one thing I forgot to put on this board, this board is, is answerable to the membership. Uh, we have a 25% rule, I think, um, which is that 25% of the members say they don't like the current board, they get a new one. Um, so it's a pretty low threshold and you know, pretty easy to replace the whole lot. Um, the, the, however, the members, they didn't elect me, they can't get rid of me, but the board can. 
Um, so again, having a system with built-in checks and balances, everyone's con yeah, you know, I can't go rogue and take over the entire project, even if I wanted to. Um, and that's how it should be. You know, there should be a challenge in there. There should be something to keep me on my toes and keep me honest and keep everything yeah, smoother. Because yeah, yeah. Otherwise, how can how can we be sure I'm doing things yeah, with my responsibilities really in mind? And so you end up with, back to this quote of, yeah, corporations are people. <laughs> In a democratic model, the corporation has to start acting like one. Because the only way that SUSE can get something done in OpenSUSE is if they're acting like peers. That SUSE employees have to be part of OpenSUSE the same way that some random contributor is a part of OpenSUSE. They don't have any additional control because they've got a SUSE email address. Um, the only control they have is literally through the commits which they put into the project. But their commits are no more important or no more overarching than any commit from any other person who's also working in the project. Um, that means they have to keep up with their, their upstreams, either various different parts of the OpenSUSE project um, or, or you know, obviously the different upstreams they're dealing with across the world. Um, which is a, a, an interesting proposition that went to companies to realize, okay, they, you know, effectively other people are creating work for you because you, know, you have to keep up with these other people. Um, and when there is a change that they want to have, like, yeah, for example, thank you, uh, restructuring the, you know, like, like me re recently restructuring our BTFS layout, you know, I had to go and persuade the community at large that that was you know, a good thing and, you know, I couldn't just go in there and throw it in because I'm chairman of OpenSUSE. And like I say, they can take it out any moment they want anyway. But corporations already know how to do this. You know, the kernel works under very similar principles to this. No single company has overarching control of the kernel. No single company has overarching control of OpenStack. So why the heck do the Red Hats and the Canonical of the world, who know how to work in this kind of environment, not create one when they're building a system, you know, building their own project at home? Yeah, they go and make some nice little fiefdom which they can control with their guys in charge. And I think that's wrong. I think it's really missing a trick and I think it's actually really holding these companies back um, because they can't be as agile and as fast and as flexible dealing with what's really going on in the open source world at large because they're just going to be focused on what they've decided internally in their little ivory castle. So in conclusion, distributions, all of them, I think you should get rid of your technical committees entirely and your dictators. You, know, you should not have them, you do not need them. You're just creating ways of saying no to the very people you need to keep your project going. But when it comes to decision-making models, you know, I favor duocracy over democracy. You know, especially direct democracy, you just will never get a decision made if you ask everybody everything. That means you need to trust and empower your volunteers to drive your project. You've therefore need to have some way of dealing with deadlocks and, and breaking that cycle like, like a, a mediation body but limit their scope. Don't fall into the trap of starting with them as a mediation body and then they end up evolving to some kind of technical committee and then they end up you know, being responsible for deciding your long-term goals. It doesn't work. And corporations need to realize, especially with their local, their local distribution projects that they are close to them, give up the control. You don't need it. It holds you back when you have that control. You know, if you treat your distribution communities like your other upstreams, your distribution community can start moving faster like your other upstreams. That's how you can make money quicker because you can go to market with that new stuff faster. Mm -hmm. you know, so why hold your teams back? Why, why, hold, why hold your friendly volunteers back? It doesn't make any sense and yet we see it all over the place. And have a lot of fun. This is what open source is about. And with that, I am done and have a bit of time for questions. Yes? Um. So I'm coming from a background where it's more like contributing code than many packages. Yep. How do you deal with, uh, we often have contribution contributors that come with a big chunk of change, but there is no not always a guarantee that we will continue maintaining this. So yep. the burden of maintaining com comes on on the project. Yep, which, which is why like your, your review process and, and your tooling there, you know, the, that, that should be your primary question of, of, you know, can we understand this, this contribution in a way that we can maintain it, you know, if this guy disappears? So that, that and does it work are basically the only two acceptance criteria for anything in like OpenSUSE, for example. And I think those are the only two acceptance criteria you really should have.
I don't think you should be getting too much into the nitty gritty of deciding is this you know, always the right best technical solution. If you can understand it and it works, why not accept it? But can you still maintain it? I mean, if it's, uh, for example, if it's support for a new platform that, you don't, that nobody else has, yep. and you can't understand it, you can accept it, it works. Yep. But um, how do you make sure that you don't break it if you change something else? Well, it's a fair point. Well, um, in the case of OpenSUSE, we throw in a new open QA test at it. But um, yeah, I mean, gener generally, I mean, that that should be a fair question for that guy on that initial contribution. Like, basically, you know, in a, for something like a new platform, there, you know, yeah, they're creating as an environment where they probably need to ask a little bit of a question of, you know, okay, are you going to be able to look after this for a little bit longer? But thinking in those terms totally changes the way you're going to ask that question than just saying, no, we don't support that platform. So, you know. This, that's kind of it's, this is, I know it seems all like psychic mumbo jumbo, but yeah, you do need to think. You do need to kind of realize that you should be thinking in these terms to frame that question that way. Spider, so yeah. Uh, how do you deal with uh, the festiveness of a unmaintained package that things build on? So you had the, a developer who was maintaining it. They got fed up. Who lost it? It's still an integral part of the core, but nobody really wants to touch that thing. Yeah. Then you throw it away and with everything else that's, that's attached to it. It's amazing how quickly that motivates someone to take care of that nasty thing at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, you, you, you threaten to do so first and then you do it. You, mean, you, know, you don't want to break everything out there. But in fact, we just had that. Like, oh, which pack? We had just had that. Um, recode. recode. Yeah. We, just, we literally just had that with Recode in OpenSUSE. Um, so, you know, that's. Sorry. <laughs> <We've> <laughs> um, they uh, the Russian program Yeah. And that but that kind of it's a perfect example. That that sort of craziness actually in this model drives innovation we've now have a, fort a recodeless fortune it's a good model yes just wanted to comment uh, a couple of things about yep. Debian and Ubuntu mm -hmm. I'm coming from that perspective uh, so you, you, um, you mentioned that canonical they have this like quite a corporate structure and yep. things, which is like uh, I'm, 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 my, I'm a Debian developer and I find it quite difficult to being a Debian developer to push things into Ubuntu even for packages I maintain in Debian and which Ubuntu takes from Debian. Yep. But it sort of makes sense for them because like there's a, quite some difference between Red Hat and Fedora for example and Debian and Ubuntu because like in Red Hat and Fedora like most of the drive happens comes from Red Hat even though even if it happens in Fedora first maybe I'm not quite sure I'm, uh, how it works in, in, in there, but I, I guess like most of the people are like Red Hat employees and they do these things in, in there. So it's but in in uh, Debian and Ubuntu relationship is different. So like the driver force, the community behind Debian and Ubuntu builds on that. That's why probably for Canonical it makes sense. But even then, I, I wouldn't like, I, I wouldn't argue that it doesn't make sense. I, I agree that it it's, it's a, not it's open a, enough. Yeah. I, you know, this makes sense for Canonical. Canonical are happy, fine. Yeah. I think it's wrong. You know, I don't. I don't think it doesn't make sense. I just think it's wrong. And I think, I mean, there's the the kind of practical examples that I've mostly focused on in this talk of, uh, you know, the agility and the ability to deal with you know, crazy changes quickly. Um, but also, I just think it's morally wrong. We're meant to be an open. You know, we're meant to be doing open source. Why are we limiting our? Op why you know, Why are Canonical limiting their options in their code base? Long term, isn't that just shooting themselves in the foot with how fast they can? go to market with their own stuff. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't really want to make Ubuntu a nice, you know, better competitor than OpenSUSE, but, you know, if they did pay attention, they would be quicker. Yeah, uh, for, for Debian, you, uh, uh, I'm not sure how, how familiar are you with decision uh, deci uh, decision taken in, in Debian, but uh, the thing is, like, what the example you had with System D, for example, uh, you know, the technical committee in Debian it's the very last resort, which is like, like if nothing else helps, they step in. Yep. So normally, it it it, uh, it doesn't have any role in any decision taken at all. No, only if the 
huge uh, fractions of developers who cannot agree on something, or if there's just one developer who keeps saying no to everyone, in this case, this is when the technical committee steps in, because like in system D, it was one of the situations like that. So yeah. uh, there was a discussion without involving them. Should we switch to system D? Oh, probably we should. And there's a bunch of people coming saying, oh, no, we hate Leonard. <laughs> but um, like when it kept you know going on yeah. for a long time, someone said, "Okay, let's take it up to the CC CTT because we can't stand it anymore." Like, yeah. yeah, like it is not, I, and it continued for half yeah, more years. Exactly. I, I mean, I, I get that, but I can't. I kind of want to post. Like, yeah. Like, like yeah. Oh, I I, I, I get that, things. but but I, I still kind of want to pose the question of if Debian didn't have a technical committee. You know, how different could things be? If they followed this I model more... I continue for at least half a year more, honestly, because it, it, it took quite, I, I think it took quite some, you know, Bidel when, when he ended it by just saying, okay, I'm, I'm the chair, I'm ending this now, yeah. and I'm using my chair vote, which is normally not being used, yeah. but he did use it, like, to, to gain the majority. And it mostly, like, okay, people who continued hating Leonard, they went out and they created Debian, whatever, like, and yeah. it stopped. Without that decision, yeah. it probably would continue for quite a long time. I see where you're going, but I think I think there is another way. I, th I think I think this probably. Yeah. But thank you. Very there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. So you don't choose to again.